Welcome back uh, to the uh, annual meeting of the members, and uh, we've got a real uh, a real treat here. At the, uh, we're getting ready to conduct our Warrant Officer Talent Management Panel, and today we are honored to be joined uh, by uh, the Deputy Director of the Talent Management Task Force, Brigadier General Tom Drew. Uh, with him live here today is our uh, Senior Warrant Officer Advisor to the CSA, uh, CW5, Yolandria Dixon Carter, our Senior Warrant Officer Advisor to the ATM Task Force, uh, Mr. Rick Knowlton. Um, we also have uh, CW5, Will Robinson from the uh, HQDA CIO G6 office. Uh, we are also going to be joined remotely by CW5 John Yerby, the CCWO of CASCOM. And hopefully, uh, he's in a meeting with the CAT commander right now and he's going to try and jump in last. Uh, we'll be joined by our uh, CAC CCWO, CW5 Steve Kilgore. And right now, without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Brigadier General Drew. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Special thank you to Warrant Officer Association for letting Rick and I come here and kind of explain uh, some of the initiatives that, that we have in the Army to, to help uh, the Warrant Officer Corps build and prosper uh, in the future operational environment. Uh, full disclosure, um, I, I've been a member of the Warrant Officer Association since December of 1983. Um, so I've got uh, I've got a vested interest in this topic uh, just as much as Rick and, and everybody on the task force because we got to get this right. You know, as you look at the future operating environment, it's it's going to be more high tech. It's we're going to need very very specialized people to make the systems that we're currently uh, generating out at Army Futures Command, we're gonna have to have very, very top quality people do that for our Army to make us uh, successful uh, and prevail against uh, any adversary that may that may come in front of us. I think secret uh, the secret sauce of the United States Army, you know, you hear people talk about the, the NCO Corps and without a doubt, you know, if you look at the, the major armies around the world, you know, the big difference is we empower our NCOs. The other difference that doesn't get quite as much attention is, is the power of the Warrant Officer Corps within our Army. You know, if you look across uh, s some of our branches that we have in the Warrant Officer Corps, um, they are really the, the technical experts and the continuity and the professionalism of that branch. I mean, I, I'm an aviation branch person, uh, commission people, NCOs, uh, kind of flow through their different units. It's the Warrant Officer Corps that sets a standard, uh, a very, very high bar for everybody else to match. Uh, and as an aviation guy, uh, I, I was, like I said, I was a Warrant Officer back in the early 80s. I was, you know, in the system back then. And you look now and the leaps that we've made in the professionalism, not, not of the Warrant Officer Corps, but of Army Aviation in my case, uh, by making aviation branch, making the commission officers stick around, uh, you know, and not go off to artillery and, and armor and all the other things we used to do. Uh, it's the Warrant Officer Corps that has taken those that weren't really full-time professionals in aviation and made them world-class. Uh, so I think as you look to the future, and Rick will talk uh, about some of our initiatives that we, we've got going, but as you look to the future in some of these things that are burgeoning in our Army for talent uh, and capability, whether it's uh, it's uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, biometrics, you name the thing that we're going to need in our tactical army to be successful. I think Warrant Officer, the Warrant Officer Corps is the path that gets you uh, to success. Uh, so this is really, really important to me. Uh, and I know it's important to Rick and he'll explain all that stuff uh, and, and to the army. I think if you look at uh, the, the power of the Warrant Officer Corps, although small compared to NCOs and the Officer Corps, uh, the power of the Warrant Officer Corps is really what, what makes us unique. Uh, not only is the Warrant Officer Corps, but the people in it are the asymmetric advantage for the United States Army. I mean, if you look at how we're going to win the next fight, it's going to be largely because we have the right forces in our Warrant Officer Corps 
and the right people associated. And Rick's going to go through that. But again, hey, I, I really appreciate being here. This is an important thing uh, for the Army and for our nation. And I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, Jack, also, thanks for putting this together. I really appreciate it. And especially those that are listening and, and interested in talent management, thank you for participating as well. We have a lot to share. You know, I start off with, uh, this is my squad right here, and I'm proud to be a part of this team. And, you know, it's just, uh, I think it's a great initiative in itself. Uh, and so I just, I just want to shout out about that. But so the Talent Management Task Force actually has 55 initiatives uh, active right now. We're peppered, as in warrant officers, across a lot of those initiatives, but eight specifically are directed and focused on warrant officers themselves. And those are the eight that I'm going to start off with just to give an update on where they are. And then, uh, obviously, some of the other questions that come out later might uh, bring in some of those others, such as ATAP and where we are with KSBs, et cetera. So the first two initiatives I want to talk about are actually legislative proposals. We didn't put those into uh, the... Uh, process in January of this year. It's about a two-year process, so it's they're due to be uh, hopefully followed through by the fiscal year 22 NDAA, or National Defense Authorization Act. And those two initiatives actually you might be familiar with just because they were commission officer initiatives in the NDAA 2019 um, cycle. And the reason why we're not, we're not in that cycle, unfortunately, was twofold. One, we didn't have a representation on the team at that time, and General McConnell recognized that, uh, and that's how my predecessor, Doug England, was brought to the team. And then two, inside of Title 10, uh, warrant officers are actually mentioned in different chapters. So just because it changed for commissioned officers doesn't automatically change it for warrant officers. So what we wanted to do is recognize some of the positive changes that were made for commissioned officers, kind of like low-hanging fruit, and get after uh, th those processes uh, as well. So out of those, the two that I want to talk about, and they've been combined into one legislative proposal recently, is merit-based promotions and the opt-out of promotion. For merit-based promotions, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's in play now with commissioned officers. Majors have, have uh, been rewarded by that. And what that will allow us to recognize those top performers, don't hold a percentage to me because it changes based on the size of the promotion board, but 10, 20% of the top performers will be promoted at the front uh, end of the, of the year, so the first month or two, and then the remaining will be based on the traditional formula of time and grade. So I'd like to point out, for example, those handful of below the zone um, performers compete just like everybody else in that OML, and if they're at the top five or 10 of that list, then they'll be promoted first instead of last like they have been in the past. I think that's very exciting. The other one is opt out of promotion. So for the commissioned officers, opting out of promotion was designed for them to allow them to increase their broadening assignments. And, and although um, there's value in that for, for warrant officers, what we're wanting to get after, after is the ability to deepen our technical and tactical proficiencies. So what this does is it, it, it's purely an option for, for that individual who is in a grade, is approaching the next grade, but feels in, that they have not, either by uh, practice, by position, have not been able to get that deepening uh, experience that they want. And this allows them to request uh, to be delayed by one year being looked at for the first time, simply to allow them to either retain that job, finish that deployment, or do whatever it might be in the grade that they're in so that they don't pushed out of that job uh, uh, and, and, and prepare better for that next rank. Those are the two uh, promotions, the good the, or the, uh, legislative proposals. The good news, just literally, this is something that there's events that happen nearly every week. And just in the last week, because it is at the legislative level, it was required that the Navy uh, buy off on our idea, and they think it's a great idea, and so that's concurrence from them, and that's very often a sticking point simply because the Navy does um, manage their warrant officers different than, than we do. The next three I'm going to talk about are all three Army directives. That process normally takes about a year, maybe a little bit longer this year because of all the things that have uh, gone through the staffing requirements of the past year, you know, from COVID to uh, diversity inclusion. So Understanding that 
it takes time, but the great news I want to say about all three of these ADs, literally as of yesterday, they have cleared the um, legal review, and um, that's a big step for us because really now all we have to do is send them back to the to the uh, pilot uh, proponents that are interested in doing this, and, and the next uh, few steps here should be re relatively quick, allowing us to have it in have them, all three in implementation in FY21. So those three specifically are uh, direct appointment to CW2. So that's an S, that's a special forces pilot. They're the ones that asked for that. And what they're, the drive behind this was they wanted to one, recognize those senior NCOs or E7, 8s and 9s uh, that have actually have this experience to, to actually start that job as a team leader as, as a W2. Um, the other thing that, that it helps incentivize is, although there is safe pay, which basically covers your basic pay differences, an E7, 8, or 9 moving to a W1, it doesn't cover their housing differences or any of the other incentives that they had. So this is to help reduce that gap financially for those senior NCOs coming over. Again, it's a pilot for the special forces. Um, the requirements to become a special forces warrant officer have not changed. and uh, it'll be at the completion of all those requirements to where they would be uh, pinned on as W-2s. The next one we have in the, uh, in the process, and it's again, they're, they're all three just cleared the OT-JAG level at this point, le legal level, is the Aviation W-1 time and grade. So this was really uh, uh, um, thought of in the idea of allowing the warrant officer, junior warrant officer, the W-01, to have more time at that initial level to, to learn their trade. And quite frankly, it, we have to acknowledge that as our MOSs get more uh, technical and really have more tactical requirements to, to train, the length of time it takes for these guys to get qualified is, is actually in some cases, especially at Fort Rucker, uh, they're becoming WTs before they're even MOS qualified. So what this does is it sets it sets that qualification as a 24 month time and grade requirement. So W1 finishes flight school, he gets qualified in his MOS, he'll serve as a W1 for 24 months before being eligible to pin on CW2. And again, this allows them to learn, to do the things that a W1 should be able to do without finding himself in flight school or, or in, his, uh, in his course, now in a W2 and not even qualified in his MOS. That does that protects both the individual and really it protects the branch as as they obviously don't want to be in a situation where they have a they have a W two that isn't qualified maybe can't get through flight school for whatever reason medical or otherwise and now we're trying to seek a branch that has uh, something that they might be able to offer to him. The third one uh, that we have going, and this is a big one, and it's a little bit more complicated, but this is where retired uh, regular Army warrant officers. Uh, are showing an interest <clears throat> in wanting to serve in the National Guard or Army Reserve. Uh, you know, t when I first heard about this or this idea was brought to me, I, I couldn't imagine that there wasn't already some policy written that would allow that to happen, but there isn't quite frankly. So someone who uh, has retired from the uh, Army, regular Army, there's no means for them to continue service either by the Guard or the Reserves, and this is what that's getting after. And it, the intent behind it is also so that they can continue receiving their retirement pay and then serving in either the Guard or the Reserves, just understanding that under the current limitations that we have, that the easy way of saying is double dipping. If you're on a drill weekend, then that you would receive the higher of the two pays. Just to be clear, it's a common question that I get. But we're excited about this because especially under the current environment out there, um, there are folks that don't necessarily uh, looking to come back on active duty, but would love to continue in their trade uh, and that camaraderie of being in the guard or the reserves in their hometown where they might be. <clears throat> so the next uh, things I'm going to talk about real quick are the initiatives that we launched uh, basically in our last planning conference, which was in, in February of just this past year. Um, those were two things we talked about uh, the idea of studying warrant officer competitive category expansions and then also warrant officer selective continuation. So both similar but different. So for the first one, the warrant officer competitive categories, what we're looking at is under current industrial age policy, we have just two categories. And those two categories are either aviation 
or tech, or aviation or the rest. That's how I look at it because now you're putting everybody else in the same category to compete for promotion. So the problem that we see with that immediately is that it becomes an aggregate game. It becomes the numbers required to get promoted. And although the ORSAs and the branches have the capability to look at uh, MOSs to have a floor at the MOS level, we say, one, why don't we continue down the granularity of the skills that they have, the skill, S the SQIs that they might have? And then also, why don't we not better focus on what the <coughs> particular skills, and as we move towards KSBs, those KSBs might be to allow us to better recognize the talent that we're seeking. So the limitations I want to, uh, the, you know, as we study this, and that's where we are in this, is it's a study phase. We, the AR 600-8-29, just a brand new one just came out. It's dated, it's a dated 9 September, effective just a couple weeks ago, 9 October specifically. Um, at the good side of this new uh, regulation is it actually brings warrant officers and addresses many of the things that used to be cluttered in various uh, other uh, instructions, regulations, et cetera. It brings them all in one place. But what it does clarify and what it does show is that there's a requirement to have, um, there's a requirement to have a representative on the board for each of the categories that we have. So regulatory, right now the policy says you have to have at least a minimum of five on the board. And then if there's more than five categories, you have to have representation from each one of those. And so if we do expand from the current of two categories to a, a potential of per branch or by centers of excellence, we have to consider if there's gonna be a cost increase of increasing the board. Currently, the, based on the board size, if we go to a COE, a nine category type event, we could probably very carefully uh, do this without extra cost. So we're, it's, again, we're studying it, we're talking to the proponents, and this is something that we're getting after. And this is really, again, as KSBs start to come on board, we wanna be able to, not only train KSBs, not only acquire by KSBs, but also look at promoting uh, with KSBs into consideration. The other one I mentioned was the Warrant Officer Selective Continuation Management. So similar but different. Similar as in we want to have that granule S down to the SQI uh, look at each one of these individuals. And it's not a small group, but I will say if you're a CW4 up for CW5, that's a big cut. And we're losing great experience just because of a really an artificial number as to when the, this person has to, to leave us. So what we want to look at is two things. One, are we, are we retaining the right people and are we retaining them for the right reasons? Are we, are we, are we filling those shortages in, in specific skills, SQIs that are short out there? Because right now we're not doing it to the level that we could. We want proponent involvement in recognizing uh, 2G1, what those specific shortages and skills are so that we're going after and retaining the right people and get away from the aggregate type of uh, approach. Uh, and then also, as uh, if those of you who've had friends or have been uh, involved in this, it's agony that second year after being passed over that first time. And if you, if you can be told by HRC that you are inside one of these, one of these categories that is looking, being looked at for CellCon, and so, and, and uh, as a shortage, then we, why not have that conversation with that family, with that individual saying, hey, I can't tell you after the board, right after the board, whether or not you've been selected, but I can tell you, you are in the CellCon, uh, you at least are eligible for CellCon. And so, you know, you have a job doing the things that you want to do that you love, and you can better plan for that rather than being told, you know, at the release of the board, uh, and then you have seven months in a day to find, uh, find a new life. The last one I want to talk about uh, before handing it off to uh, Ms. Dixon Carter is the Title 10 review. And this actually wasn't something that we started out with. Uh, you may remember Doug talked about wanting to have a study to, to, to do across the board changes. Uh, and in, in talking to a SAS committee member, uh, one of the things that we are looking at is a complete Title 10 review. And so, I was new at the job when that conversation occurred and I went back to Title 10, opened it up and realized it was about 3,000 pages, realized that we're in there about 685 times according to how you do the PDF search, realized I had a little bit of homework to do. Well, COVID came along and it gave me a lot of opportunity to sit at my desk and start studying. So a couple things I've learned from that and just I'll, I'll share with you is one, what I did learn is that 
the Warrant Officer Management Act of 1991 really gets after Chapter 33. It's one section. It's about 11 or 12 sections in itself, one chapter, I should say, with 11 or 12 sections. And inside that is really where all the management of warrant officers is. It's the heart of it. And in there, in most cases, it talks about delegation authority to the secretary concerned. If it doesn't say that, that means that not only does DOD or or the Navy have to, but all the DOD and, and we have to have Congress say it's okay to make a change, changes that we're trying to get after right now. Changes that take two years, just uh, uh, if if the Army wants to do it, regardless of, of if, if anybody else has interest in doing it. And quite frankly, we've had some failures in the past over time, simply because, uh, again, how what warrant officers do in the Army is very different than what most people understand, and even those warrant officers in other services uh, do. So sometimes we have a great idea, and it, it fails in the legislative process. So if we can delegate the authority down to the war, uh, to the secretary concerned, which would be our army secretary. We're now bringing those changes into an AD level, cutting the time in half and focusing on the things that we're wanting to get after in talent management. So that's, that's the eight initiatives that I've been working on. Uh, I'd have, uh, you may, some of you may know chief Olga Elliott. She's down supporting BCAP at Fort Knox right now, but between the two of us, these are the things that we're focused on. We're excited about the progress that's been made literally in just in the last few days. And uh, when it's my time to come back after I hand it off to Ms. Dixon Carter here, I will uh, be happy to answer any questions. Andrea, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Great presentation as always. And um, to General Drew, thank you so much, sir, for being out here. We appreciate and we appreciate you being a part of the Warrant Officer Association. It's always great to have our senior leaders um, to come out and to support us. Um, and again, as I said on yesterday, thank you to the United States Army Warrant Officer Association, our executive director, Mr. Jack Jatel, and to our president, um, Mr. Joe Concilio. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of, whether I am in a part of a panel or behind the scenes, um, you are truly a part of my squad. And to um, you know, the senior one officer squad, to Hal and Teresa and Steve Kilgore and all of the COEs and the HQDA um, senior one officers to include Mr. Rick Noten. Thank you all for your con- unconditional support. Um, it has been extremely challenging this year for many of us. Um, you know, with COVID, uh, the pandemic, with civil unrest and so many other things that are happening, um, it seems like we can't seem to catch a break, catch an opportunity um, to to fellowship, to get together. But I would tell you um, that what is happening, what the one officer cohort is doing in the, in the realm of talent management, whether you're in uniform or you're retired and you're supporting us, whether you're a DA, uh, a civilian or family members, um, we are all in this together. And we cannot grow our cohort without the support of each other, without the support of starting with our Army Army senior leadership, which is also a part of my squad. I am in their squad, the secretary, um, secretary of the Army, the chief of staff of the Army, and the sergeant major of the Army. Um, and they are all very concerned about the well-being of our cohort. They're always contributing, they're always supporting, and they're always, excuse me, they're always wanting to make help make an impact for us to do, continue to do great things. And so in the realm of talent management, all of the initiatives that Rick spoke about on today, um, I would like to to just focus on on managing talent. That is important that we manage talent. Um, As Hal said earlier today, sometimes I don't think we're managing talent. I'm just gonna be very candid with you. We're managing comfort. We're managing comfort. And some of our positions, although they're not coded that you have 24 months with the possibility of of extension for a year in it, um, some of us get very comfortable with what we're doing. We get very comfortable with whom we're working with. They're comfortable with us. And they don't necessarily want to open that up for other talents, other talents. And so we specifically as senior warrant officers, there are about 26,000 plus warrant officers across the total army and close to 800 
CW5s across the total army. And so we as, as seniors, we really have to do a better job at how we are managing talent, even at the lower level or our junior levels um, as we're mentoring. Again, I will continue to reiterate, just like SMA is, in, is talking about Tim's, this is my squad. My initiative is time. Talk, inspire, mentor, and engage. Talent starts with that non-commissioned officer. It starts with assessing that non-commissioned officer. And once you start and you're looking at that talent and you're thinking about as the initiatives as we're doing for talent management, think about how does Staff Sergeant Dixon Carter fit into, you know, the realm of some of the initiatives that we're trying to get after. Um, because it's not just becoming a warrant officer, it's becoming a sustained warrant officer and enduring warrant officer, you're going to contribute. It's, it's, it's really a lifelong commitment, whether you're in or out of uniform, if you will. And so it's, it's signing, it's you're endorsing that, that talent, that staff sergeant. But if that staff sergeant is not ready to make that commitment to be a warrant officer, we have to be from the three, four, and five level that can endorse those application, applications. You have to be candid and honest with them and tell them that they're not ready to take that next leap yet, right? But don't leave them there. Talk to them on how to get better, how to, what, what they're lacking in, what they need to improve on. Talk to them on how to improve that. And yes, Staff Sergeant Dixon Carter will probably go and shop and find another senior warrant officer that likes me, I like them, and we're comfortable with each other. And so they will endorse my packet. But as a senior warrant officer, and you know that I am, I am in Mr. Robinson's squad, you should be calling Mr. Robinson asking him why is Staff Sergeant Dixon Carter coming to me to endorse her application. Um, so I, I think, you know, in terms of recruitment for talent management, we have to do a better job in how we recruit in, in that area also. Um, assignments. I understand that, you know, with our aim to a marketplace and, and it's open right now, um, that the chief of staff of the Army has said that the soldier will get a vote in his or her assignment. And I, Yolandra Dixon Carter, do solemnly support that. However, comma space. The Army also gets a vote because there are needs of the army. And too many of us are saying, you know, specifically as our, our warrant officers and in senior leadership positions, that we're not moving. I just bought a home. My spouse just got a really good job. You know, my kid just started elementary school and I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to inconvenience them. And I get it. Oh my gosh, I get it. I served dual military. Um, so for 21 years, you know, my husband is now retired. So I truly understand that. Right. But at the same time, you have to ask yourself, the more rank you earn, the less assignments you, you, you know, locations and uh, locations and positions there are. So you have to ask yourself if you're committed to this, you have to be committed to moving when it is when it's your time to move. You have to move and you have to have these conversations with your families before that time comes. You know, sit down and talk about where you would like to go next. Hey, I just made the W4 for list. I'm promotable. Or even before that, I'm in the zone for promotion. If I'm selected for promotion, I will more than likely have to move. What are some of the areas? Where do you want to go? You know, we all have a friend of a friend that we can phone, email, text or MS teams and say, hey, what requisitions are out there? What's opening up for me? And your COEs and your proponent warrant officers, they will tell you what's what's opening up for you. Right. And so you have those candid conversations, include your families in on these conversations of where you would like to go next. But when it's time for you to move, please move. We see your talent, we see your knowledge, skills and behaviors, and we need to assess them, excuse me, we need for you to, we need to leverage them at a different assignment and open up that position for someone else to get the opportunity that you have. You know, um, so we in terms of that and talent management, if you will, for our aim to marketplace. And I know many of us warrant officers, we're kind of out of cycle, specifically Compo One. We're out of cycle um, in some of our moves and those that's in discussion. But for for some for most of them, that's in the cycle. You know, if it's time to move, it's time to move. Um, and then and, and finally, I would just like to say 
in terms of, of talent management. We have to do a better job in diversity. In diversity. Um, I understand that becoming a warrant officer is a volunteer thing, that we volunteer to submit an application. But every one of us are ambassadors of recruiting. And so we have to go out there and seek diverse talent, diverse talent. It is it we have to go to go out there and 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 talk, have conversations, you know, um, and, and don't just wait for people to come to us. We have to go out there and seek that diverse talent, whether it's gender, whether it's race or even in our branches. Let's be honest. You know, many of our, our combat armed branches for warrant officers, we don't have a lot of diversity in those branches at all. And, you know, you 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 ask someone, hey, why don't why won't you go aviation, Yolandria? Oh, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. And then we leave it like that. Well, I am really afraid of heights, but, <laughs> you know, um, and we leave it there. No, you know, encourage that person, inspire them, take time with them and engage them on, you know, well, because most aviators, are you afraid of heights? Don't answer that. <laughs> No, but seriously, um, you know, just take time out there and, and talk to them. And, and we have to recruit diverse, diverse, excuse me, diverse warrant officers that's out there. But it all ties into talent management. And it, it all begins with when you start recruiting those non-commissioned officers to come in or if they're coming in from high school to, um, to, to become an aviator. It starts there and it starts with each and every one of us to go out there and to recruit and do the right things. Um, I think Rick said, are we retaining the right people for the right reason? I think each one of us should look in the mirror and ask ourselves that, am I keeping warrant officer, Chief Warrant Officer Dixon Carter in this position for the right reason? Am I managing her talent or am I managing my comfort? Thank you. And I am going to turn it over to Mr. Robinson, CIO G6. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Uh, sir, thank you for participating in this panel with us. Jack, Joe, th uh, thank you for hosting this. Um, it, it's it's really interesting uh, listening to the panelists and, and having this discussion about about where the Army's going. And, and, and inside of our domain, um, inside of the G6, which is the cyber domain, which includes Signal Corps, uh, the cyber workforce or the cyber core that includes the electronic warfare guys and information operation, which makes up that domain. And, and, and as over the past year or so, we've been looking at how do we uh, manage the talent or manage the processes that will that will govern the talent in the future. So we ripped the play right out of the, the secretary and the chief's playbook and the people strategy. So so we looked at the, the four lines of effort, acquiring talent. Um, developing the talent, employing the talent, and retaining the talent. So, so as we looked at acquiring the talent, we had to be really conscious of who we are looking to recruit um, into the warrant officer cohort. And, and, I, and I'm going to get to those reasons why. Um, so the, the, at the time that they are, I was recruited into the warrant officer cohort in 1998, um, I, I had a certain set of skills that, that would be common thread that we thought that would have sustained me over a 15 year or a 10 year period, which was not necessarily the case, but that was the, the matter of course. Well, we know now that over the time period, and, and, this, and this spans across all of the domains of operations for the Army, that we're constantly evolving, technology is changing, processes are changing, systems are changing, and Army Futures Command is accelerating that. And as we are accelerating that, who do we recruit to become a warrant officer that has the ability to evolve and change rapidly? We have to have that. So we have to be conscious of who we were recruiting. So inside of our domain and inside of signal, cyber and electronic warfare, we're very conscious of, you know, which which NCOs we're trying to get after those guys. They might be the smartest guy in the room. But if you're not willing to evolve, how, how is that going to look? four years from now when I tell you that we're going to be doing an anti-jamming technique versus a, a cyber payload. So that's foundational for us. That's how we want to build our foundational for our cohort. So uh, uh, acquiring the skills is important. So near and dear to my heart was be 
uh, developing the talent. So as you look inside of people's strategy, it really talks to how do we're going to develop the workforce of the future. So for us, we, we use the theory um, inside of um, both Signal slash IT in the cyber workforce that we're about a 20 to 25 percent change in everything that we do every year. So four years from now, we're 100 percent different than what we would have been um, four years ago. And that that's you know, we've been living with that reality. It's going to be increasingly more reality for the aviators, for the logisticians, for everyone. So we just happen to have been the frontline trace of that problem because of technology. But technology is now going to drive a lot of things that we're going to do even in the human resources world. So as you look at that um, as developing the talent. So, you know, inside of when we looked across our MOSs in the Army for for warrant officers, signal specifically, we have three of them. So when we looked about what, what skills do we have today, what skills do we need tomorrow, we were about 70% of, we needed 70% new skills, but retain a lot, 30% of the skills that we had before, and those other skills were accentuated. So as we looked at it, how do we train, take all 100, all 1,000 of these Signal Corps warrant officers, and then give them 70% more skill in 36 months? to meet the chief's initiative, to be able to meet uh, phase line readiness, to get to phase line overmatch. So now we're looking at how do we do that? And we're looking to leverage a lot of stuff that the Army Talent Management Task Force is doing to, to drive a lot of those changes. We're also looking at how do we look at how do we train these people, not going back to the mothership of Fort Gordon or going back to your centers of excellence, but how can we bring that training to the point of need? So as we bring that training to the point of need, how do we ensure that it is to the standards and, and you are now trained to that level of proficiency? So as you look at data, and, and, and data is going to be critical to the commander making decisions um, on the battlefield, um, data engineers are going to have to have, and we, you know, signal warrant officers, information system signal warrant officers, 255 alphas, will have to engineer data of the future. And as they're engineering data of the future, that is a new skill that is required at the tactical edge. So we have to make sure that we are have the reps and sets and gain the proficiencies. So as we look at cyber operations and electronic warfare, how do we make sure that the warrant officers that are really the technical experts are making sure that the commander gets the desired effect and get the protection that he needs as he maneuvers in cyberspace to impose multiple dilemmas upon the enemy, how do we ensure that you have the required skills to do that? Now, with that being said, industry now understands that in our domain, and, it, and I'm sure it's in almost every one of our MOSs and skills, that the Army has a very wealth of talent that at the right moment, they are going to come in and says, hey, I really like the cut of your jib, Will Robinson. And I, I really think that, you know, IBM, you know, or whatever company, Amazon is the company for you. How do we keep Chief Robinson? How do we how do we retain him? How do we make sure that he stays employed? And that gets me to employment. So just like um, Chief Dixon Carter just mentioned, you know, People get comfortable in the skills and the location and the jobs that they have, right? And that and that 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 is a gift and a curse at the same time. And, and that's the way I view it. And that's the way we've been trying to advise our guys of how do we make sure that we keep you number one, fully employed to be able to meet the army needs. Two, that you have a level of satisfaction because we want you to be satisfied with what you're doing the more you develop and train and sustain. But also, how do we meet the Army's needs? And, and that's, that's, that's challenging in the aim to marketplace. And I will tell you part of the reason why, because in, in, in Signal and in Cyber and, and other places, and I'm sure it is in, in, in other branches, you may be one of one, right? So... I, I, I'm in, I'm, I work in this organization and, and I've done a great job, right? The EXO does not want me to leave, right? So, and I don't want to leave either. You know, it's nice. I mean, it's Virginia Beach. I don't know, but you know, you pick a location that, you know, I happen to be stationed in Virginia Beach or do, or do, I, do I get that assignment at Fort Campbell, right? 
Which one do I pick? And so the XO is like, hey, chief, you know, I'd really love for you to stay. I'd love for me to stay, too. So that's a one over one match in Ali Oxen Free. I got three more years in Virginia Beach. So th that is a challenge that we're looking at is how do I get Chief Robinson a blasting cap to get him out of Virginia Beach, to get him down to Fort Campbell, to 3rd Brigade Rockassans, so that he can then have that same level of expertise doing it at the tactical edge. So that, that's, that employment um, possibilities are, are very important for us, especially inside of Signal and the cyber workforce. Um, so that, that leads me to my last piece of retention. And I'm so glad that the Talent Management Task Force is looking at how do we keep our W-4s, right? Because, you know, we have that up and out philosophy inside of the Army right now. Well, a lot of my W-4s, I don't have enough space to promote to W-5. But these are really smart men and women that the Army really need to retain. However, we also have to look at they are also looking at the job market and, and inside of our workforce, there is no recession in for what we do. Right. So it's not as if, you know, so you look at the trends inside of the job market of, you know, what the what's going on in the economy and those type things that, you know, part of part of what we do is somewhat recession proof. Right. Um, and with that being said, they, they a lot of, you know, we're, as we as I and a lot of my W5 peers coaching our W-4s, is, it's starting to become increasingly more difficult to retain them because they're saying, A, number one, Chief, you're, you're trying to send me back to Fort Bragg to jump again, right? B, um, I could probably work from home and make twice the amount of money. So how do we compete with that? So I, I don't envy you, sir, on how do you fix that problem, but um, retaining retaining the workforce is going to be critical for us um, in the future. And, and, and lastly, I'd like to point out diversity. You know, um, I, I'm I'm very I'm very fortunate. We're we're very fortunate, and I and I'm very proud of seeing how the Army has you know taken a look at and and putting some focus in and 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 put the lens in on diversity. Um, being that I am you know a minority person. It was very it was a very uh, humbling experience just to just to see that that taking place. Um, and then also seeing the initiatives that are happening, uh, you know, uh, when they're doing interview process, they want to be able to see the person uh, on there so that they can so that a commander or the leadership can ensure that they have a diverse uh, squad. And that, that that's important. And, and, and as we as we go through our as we go through our careers mentoring and coaching people, we, we also have to be very, very conscious of that. And, and so I, I know that that was your dismount, Chief, but I, I, that was part of my dismount, so I apologize. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'm really thankful to, uh, to the association every year putting this on and talking about talent and talking about the initiatives that are going on inside of the Pentagon to uh, to develop and cultivate the Warren Officer cohort. So I, I thank you all for your time. Yes. Uh, so I believe, uh, do we also have Mr. Yerby on the line? Yes, right here. Oh, Yerby. Oh, okay. Technology. <laughs> 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 Mr. Robinson and, and I just shared a moment there. You know, I'm a I'm a 251 Alpha. We don't exist anymore. That's why I couldn't figure out how to turn on my own microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I believe we have Mr. Uh, Mr. Yerby on the line, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, Jack, I can hear you. Okay. Can we can we hear him or or give him a little a little juice? I was, I was going to say, can you hear me, Jack? Okay, um, sir, uh, you're up. <laughs> we're sorry you couldn't be with us uh, uh, here and live today, but we're certainly glad you could join us. Floor is yours, sir. Okay, yeah, th thank you, Jack. And I really do uh, apologize that I couldn't be there in person. And uh, and uh, again, I also apologize that couldn't get the uh, you know the big marker webinar thing to work for us. Um, but uh, but I am uh, honored uh, and uh, to. to to be part of this panel and to uh, at least be able to join you um, uh, on the phone. 
And so, um, you know, my comments, uh, you know, are, are really based around, you know, developing tactical and technical expertise is developing talent. So, you know, that's, that's what we believe here. I believe that to be the case, uh, absolutely be the case for our warrant officer cohort. You know, and so what we've done is we've taken a look um, at the direction that we're going with the Army, uh, not only modernizing but really transforming, uh, and we've uh, looked at some of our offerings, some of our opportunities that we have to build talent in, uh, in, in particular for the sustainment warrant officers. Uh, to get after multi-domain operations. And so everybody's familiar with, I believe they are familiar with training with industry and we still do that. And that's a, a great program and uh, we will continue to do that. We, th we think we get a great return on investment there uh, when we get our warrant officers out there to work with industry and learn best practices and bring that back to the force. Uh, but we've also added um, data analytics and visualizations. And so uh, what we've done here at the Sustainment Center of Excellence is really there is no officer that gets tra get trained here that doesn't receive some sort of data analytics and visualizations. And that includes the warrant officers, uh, you know, varying levels and, and, uh, and amount of training, obviously. But we have several offerings of data analytics and visualizations here uh, and, uh, and we are hitting that hard uh, because we believe that's the direction that, that the, the Army is going. We, we no longer really want commanders to make decisions based off of their gut instinct. We want them to make decisions informed by the data that they have presented to them. And so we got to get better as uh, sustainers at providing that data at the speed that they need it. And so uh, with that, we've also partnered, uh, you know, using uh, SSI down at Fort Jackson, partnered with the University of South Carolina and um, get, get warrant officers the opportunity to go to uh, some business analytics courses that they offer. Uh, everything from basic business analytics to advanced, which is a 12-week uh, advanced business analytics course. Uh, and those are, you know, uh, they would typically be TDY in return, uh, but during this environment, those are distance learning. And so those are putting, you know, skills right back into the formation so that those warrant officers are coming, coming out of. Uh, also, another program that we've uh, started here in the last couple of years and have seen great dividends is, is uh, what we call an industry-based broadening seminar. And this, these IB2 uh, seminars have a ERP focus. Right, and so you start off with, uh, you know, creating a problem statement that's ERP focused, and then you go and you kind of uh, benchmark it against industry and see how they would fix that problem, and then you bring that back and uh, and work it, and then uh, and then off and take it back to your unit again. Another um, TDY in return or distance learning. You know, we're doing everything distance learning right now, and so these are some some talents that we are. Um, you know, instilling or, or adding to our normal repertoire of talents that we have for our sustainment warrant officers because we feel that that's the direction that we need to go to train the warrant officer for, um, as I said, multi-domain operations and, and the uh, Army of the future. Uh, but, you know, quite honestly, you know, the Talent Management Task Force is doing some wonderful things, and uh, I, I, I know that, that it's a, a work in progress, um, but, you know, some of our policies and procedures uh, to manage talent have, have, you know, still some work to do, and I think we all recognize that, right? We, we, don't, we don't build Rome overnight. We've got to, you know, we've got to do it step by step. And so, as you know, that uh, warrant officers develop through progressive levels of assignment and experiences at Echelon. And as you know, warrant officers develop the majority of their talent, skills, and behaviors from their experience in the tactical and op operational assignments. So warrant officers must be placed in the right job at the right time in their career. A CW2 cannot do the job of a CW4 and it's the difference between it's really the difference between intermediate level expertise and senior level expertise. And so we shouldn't we shouldn't ask you know we should recognize that 
and recognize that if you put a CW4 and a CW2 assignment, you took away the pro progressive development of a CW2 and, and then vice versa. If you put a CW2 and a CW4 assignment, they may not bring those knowledge and skills that you need uh, to that fight. And more than likely, they will not because they have not developed through, through that uh, assignment process. Uh, and so, so manning guidance uh, can can be a hindrance uh, to Army readiness. And I know manning guidance is to ensure Army readiness, but as it employs to as it applies to employing and distributing warrant officers, and in particular, I'm talking about our high demand, low density techni technical specialties. And as uh, Mr. Robinson had mentioned. You know, a lot of times a signal warrant may be only one deep in a formation uh, or one or two deep in a formation. Well, uh, for a sustainment warrant officer, over 55% of the formations in the Army, we are one or two deep. Uh, and so that does definitely high demand, uh, low density uh, technical specialties. So the, the active component, manning guidance, uh, directs fills into units regardless of officer talent. So I think we got to look at that, right? Um, and it also directs fills uh, regardless of what talent is available. Uh, so another thing we, we need to look at, right? Apply an information age approach to maybe an industrial uh, uh, policy or mechanism that we're using. So this, uh, this forces kind of unnatural assignments or misaligning of talent. I got multiple examples, but I, I won't, won't, do, won't do those here uh, unless somebody wants to hit me up, hit me up offline. Uh, direct fills also move high demand, low density technical specialties uh, to jobs that are not priority for that specialty. I also got, got examples, right? And, and I can use, uh, you know, 921 rigor warrants is a, a perfect example of that by putting rigor warrants in, in non-airborne units uh, just because the Army um, Active Component Manning Guidance says to do so, uh, leaving uh, airborne units without, um, which leaves, uh, you know, leaves talent, you know, sometimes unfilled, and, and that's, that's, uh, that can be a problem, and that definitely impacts readiness. So I have a proposal that I have briefed uh, several times um, to be a little bit more precise on how we manage our talent because the current Army distribution process doesn't maximize aligning talent in the right place at the right time for warrant officers. I'd also point out that the Army talent alignment process doesn't go far enough to address the limitations of the Army distribution process to align talent for high demand, low density technical specialties. We can do more and we must do more to develop and employ our talented warrant officers uh, and in and, and doing so we probably just need to relook some of those policies and um, and uh, and procedures that we have. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd like to turn the floor back over to you, Jack, uh, so we can uh, open it up for what, whatever's next, uh, questions and answers, I guess. Over. Okay, uh, well, I think uh, we've had success in uh, getting my good friend, CW5, uh, Steve Kilgore on the line. Steve, are you with us? I am, Jack. Unfortunately, I'm only uh, telephone capable. Um, our system here just won't complete the bridge connection. Well, no problem. We're real happy to have you with us, uh, my friend, and uh, the floor is yours. Oh, wow. Okay. It's my turn already then. Huh? So, <laughs> yep, yep. Yep. You got here just in time, sir. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hey, it's an honor to be here talking with this group. Um, I sat in and uh, watched General Rainey's comments this morning. Uh, so I, I hope you all had a chance to uh, listen to what he had to say, um, because he's really, he's really very interested in helping us achieve what we ought to achieve for warrant officer leader expert development through the course of our career. Um, he is very interested. I guess I'm, I'm a little bit late for this meeting today because I guess sat in an Army U meeting where they were briefing him on warrant officer PME specifically and Army U's role in that and Army U's um, possibilities that we are developing for warrant officer PME. So to be clear, um, General Rainey um, gave some very broad guidance a few months ago um, that we've been working with, right? And so um, this started out as a small group 
just to explore the possible. But once that became possible, we expanded it out to include our um, all compost, all three compost in the Army, um, as well as um, all the stakeholders for Warrant Officer PME, which includes the Career College and all the centers of excellence and proponent schools. Um, Army U has been uh, heavily invested in this and CAC also. Uh, the goal is to, to make sure that the PME program that we take forward, whatever form that may be, um, ensures that the warrant officer remains dominant in, the, in their role as the technical and tactical expert going forward through Waypoint 2028 to Aimpoint 2035. That Army is expected to be significantly different than the Army we have today. So we're doing the analysis to determine what the roles of the future warrant officer are and what is the education system that needs to be in place to ensure that that warrant officer can dominate their space. Um, we're looking at the roles of the branch proponents uh, across PME. We're looking at the role and um, what should be taught in Common Core across PME. Um, one of the supporting efforts, and it's really for this next year, it's the main effort, is the development of assessments for um, every warrant officer MOS and at every level of PME to assess the tactical and technical expertise, which then can feed back into our PME system to help inform if we are getting our PME right and what we need to do to get it more right. The basis for these assessments will be rooted in the knowledge, skills, and behaviors that each proponent has developed for each warrant officer, uh, MOS and grade. Um, those are being processed now. And so we're, we're looking at the development of assessments and implementing at least a pilot program of assessments for warrant officers across the PME continuum starting in September of 2021. So that's a little less than a year from now. Um, one of the other things we're looking at is who are the appropriate commanders um, and commanding generals who can best affect positive outcomes through our PME systems? Um, General Rainey at the meeting today was uh, reluctant to give guidance and based on his words was he doesn't want to constrain our thinking into what is possible. But he did talk about the role of the COECGs and he talked about his role for warrant officer PME. And, and his belief is, and, and I believe it's rightly so when you look at the organizational structures, is he is the place where all warrant officer PME comes together, whether that's proponent driven or common core. Warrant officer PME, and he wants to take that role to be very serious. Um, and make sure that we are getting it right and delivering to the Army the kind of warrant officer um, that the Army requires. He really wants to get after educating our W-5s for that special role um, and responsibility that we do expect our W-5s to step up into, uh, and that is providing their, their years and years of knowledge and expertise back into the Army. So we're exploring um, possibilities with that. Um, you know, some of the supporting efforts on that is, is do we have the names of our PME correct to tell the Army what we're trying to do at each level of PME? Um, we're not trying to create O-grades, so naming a PME level after an O-grade PME level might not be appropriate, but we are looking at that. Um, and, and so what we're kind of experimenting with right now conceptually are naming the levels of PME after what we're trying to achieve. For instance, a CW4 by doctrine is a senior level warrant officer or senior level technical and tactical expert to be more precise with what the doctrine says. So what we believe at least conceptually is that the course that creates a senior level technical and tactical expert should be a senior course. And so, and that tells the army what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it if we were to name it so. Uh, again, that's pre-decisional, that's a concept that we're working with, um, but one of the other supporting efforts is to align PME with very distinctly identifiable key points in a warrant officer's career. So whatever level of, whatever curriculum for PME is appropriate to prepare a CW3 to go out 
and be an advanced level technical and tactical expert, which is what they are by doctrine, should occur prior to us sending them out to be that advanced level technical and tactical expert. But if it occurs too early, then the Army changes. And if it occurs too early, then we have to change the curriculum to accommodate that early attendance to PME. So we're trying to um, put the the uh, to the uh, an appropriately sized window for that warrant officer to attend PME. We also want to take the we, we believe we're going to look. We're, well, we are exploring how do we take the burden off the soldier for PME attendance, but still sure of, ensure PME attendance. And how do we take the burden off the commander in the field who has another mission? And when he's dealing with a warrant officer, uh, a very specific skill that he or she has in their command that they can't let go at any convenient time. And so how do we take that burden off the commander? And the, the, the result is, is that the burden has to be on the Army to ensure PME attendance within a given window. We're still working with concepts of that, and the, the concepts of that will not be um, universal across all three compos. So we're working with compo two and three on what that might mean. Um, but we think we're going to get there where we're going to have appropriate windows of attendance at appropriate courses that have appropriate curriculum for the outcomes that the Army expects from its warrant officers. So at this time, that wraps up uh, my intro to this presentation, and I'll pass it back to you, Jack. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Steve, and uh, for that update. And it's, it sounds like it's hot off the presses. You just came out of the meeting. Um, so we've got lots of great questions that have come in uh, for the panel. And uh, the, the first couple, I know exactly who to throw them to. Uh, but uh, Mr. Knowlton, I'm going to count on you being our moderator for most of the questions. Um, so as a matter of fact, let me See, I'm going to prove to Mr. Robinson that that I'm not completely un. Look at that. Now I'm on. <laughs> you take me right, take me right back into the Signal Corps, or maybe cyber. Who knows? I'll go to school for a year. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the first question, actually, Mr. Knowlton, is probably for you, and it regards uh, the plan that uh, you referenced. Uh, pretty close to the front of our segment here uh, about um, allowing AC warrant officers who are retired to continue doing service in the guard. And you, you talked uh, about sort of the elegant strategy on pay and how we were going to do that. Uh, this question is, would the retired ACWO in the guard or reserve be a deployable asset or would they be part of a cadre when the unit deploys? Okay, so the short answer to that is, and I don't want to step on uh, the toes of either the uh, compos, two or three, because quite frankly, they're going to be the folks hiring these, and, and those, are, those discussions, those hiring processes, we're just getting them the authority, and then they're going to go into that. But the intent behind it is not to have those kind of limitations. So it's, it's, you're, you're getting hired for a particular MOS requirement that there, there's a need for in, in their uh, compo, and that's something that most likely you are doing all through your career as an active duty warrant officer. So this isn't a Kelly Temp position. You're going into the guard, you're, and if your unit needs that's you, that's right. Just like anybody gonna, else, you're shoulder to shoulder with. There you go. Okay, that's thank you. That's great, and I know that answered the question. Um, next one is for Mr. Robinson, um, uh, and this is uh, coming from a uh, reserve component uh, individual wants to know what can our compo two and three signal core and uh, cyber warrants do to help solve our readiness challenges in our AC organizations. Some of us are very well informed in the industry. That's a great question. So, so one of the things that we're looking at is uh, how, how do we um, leverage uh, a lot of our guard and reserve guys who are um, Silicon Valley guys, advanced IT guys, and all those things. And how can we leverage that skill set to help propel us active duty guys that don't have the reps and sets they have? One of the things that we're looking at is um, as we look at plural site and training curriculums of, of uh, 
delivering content. Uh, so what content should we be delivering and in which manner should we be delivering it? We're going to be consulting those guys and make sure that we're training the right things and we're not shooting behind the duck. So oh, that's great. Um, appreciate that. Um, and, you know, kind of as a follow on, and again, I'll, I'll direct this to Mr. Knowlton and, and, and uh, as our moderator. Um, uh, what do you and the members of the panel think are some of the skills that warrant officers need to improve? What are, what are we doing to improve these skills? And I, and I know you're getting after uh, issues like training and you're, and, and you're doing studies, but, but could you address that? So to step back and take it from a little bit more of a broad perspective, and, and I think this is also, if Steve can hear the conversations that we're having, uh, Kilgore from CAC, this is where we're, we're, as we shift towards a granular capability of identifying skills, KSBs are gonna be a part of that process. Those are three tier level deep of specific skills and requirements that PME is gonna embrace. But we also need, just like you said, we're not stuck just because of what we've done in the past. Right. Now that we have that capability of, of really getting into specific individuals, what they bring to the table, at, we, we also need to be doing that with the Army and progressing as fast as the requirements progress. And so I, I think those are conversations that are, are in front of us. I think that's something that that's one of the reasons why there's the change drive at uh, at uh, CAC. Again, I'll, I'll let uh, Steve you know talk about that if he wants. But what we're wanting to do uh, from, from a talent management perspective uh, is Recognize first, as I've heard General McGee say, talent management takes work. It's an investment. It takes time. It's going to it's going to be something that we have to really, all of us have to embrace. Not just a handful of people on a team or a, or in or a, or a leader himself. This is where we have to take responsibility for the things that we have to get after. Recognize the skills that we need to improve upon and develop those programs that are going to get after those skills. Yeah, oh, and. Uh... Steve, do, Steve, did you have something to, did you have something to add to that? Sure. You know, Rick's right on the money with that, right? You know, and so we're working with the talent management task force on these on these knowledge, skills, and behaviors, the KSBs, um, to make sure that they're applicable to both assignments and what we expect of warrant officers at in certain MOSs at specific grades. Um, there's a couple outcomes once we have these KSBs firm in hand. One is like Rick alluded to, we can we can drive that back into PME and we can focus PME curriculum on developing those skills, those talents, right? So so when you ask the question, what are the things we need to get better? Well, what we're doing right now is we're doing the analysis to determine where our gaps in our in our skill sets are so that we can then drive our educational model towards covering those gaps in the skill set. Um, we to manage talent, you have to know the talent you have, right? And the, and, and the talent for the, for the average assignment out there is going to be based off of the average set of knowledge, skills, and behaviors. So when we do these assessments that I mentioned earlier, um, that's going to give us the feedback of what an individual's skills are against a baseline of, of knowledge, skills, and behaviors. But also, it will help us identify those special skills that certain people have that we might otherwise miss. And that's going to allow us to feed that back into the talent management system and, and identify those key personnel that have um, extraordinary talents or unique talents that are above and beyond the normal. Um, and so these, that's why these assessments become very important. One other factor to those assessments, if you look at the continuum of our PME, and this goes for every co uh, uh, cohort, but really is prevalent in the warrant officer cohort, we spend very little time actually at the institution for PME, regardless whether that's at the proponent or at a common core PME. And so where most of our development will need to occur in the future is in the self-development realm. And so when we provide these assessments at PME and we give the feedback to each and every warrant officer, individualized feedback of where their strengths are and where their areas are that they need to work on, then they're going to be able to go out find a mentor, find a coach, find the right people, use the right facilities um, that are going to be made available to them in order to develop their talents to be, um, to be better than what they were before in the self-developmental realm, because they're going to have very specific feedback that's going to help them and, and guide them in the development of that program. Over. Thank you, sir. 
Um, and so I, I, I have another question that I, I think you guys addressed. I, I, perhaps it, um, uh, this individual just needs a little more clarification. How is the talent management team looking at the effects of increased CELCON at CW4 on promotions to CW3 and CW4? Um, and then uh, this individual asked, why isn't the focus on building expertise and mastery for the next warrant up? of that for so the one the, the second part about building up so that that comes back to that investment that i think steve was just talking about recognizing what that individual needs and 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 bringing that gap forward to pme to make sure that they're they're not only recognizing what's required to to be successful but making sure that that individual is getting that kind of instruction and then to back it up to um filling the gap from, from W4 to W5. So I mentioned that mostly because traditionally we, th those folks that are, and, and I, you know, I, this could be taken the wrong way, but the, this is where we're seeing the deep cut in great people that the army would actually like to keep. And so we, we have to look at this from a, a couple of directions. The reason I mentioned CELCON is because if there's one thing uh, you, you try to get after when you can is the low hanging fruit. And in this case with CELCON, this is something that we already have the mechanism, the lever to pull, and we just need to recognize instead of saying, hey, we need to save X, Y, and Z, this number of people, we actually, we can, we can drill down to the very specific Chinook TAC ops officer, uh, not by person when I say that, but by trade, and we're, we're, and we're keeping the folks and, and continuing them uh, with that opportunity to go forward. What I think we need to also look at, and it's just, again, this is in the study phase, I didn't mention this earlier, is, uh, is, there, any, is there any other um, possible incentive, 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 I can't even say the word now, incentives <laughs> that, we can, that we can do that aren't necessarily monetarily, uh, whether it's uh, remaining on a, a particular assignment or, you know, um, Whatever it might be, again, we're in that that study phase, but that conversation is open. It's still it's it's still being discussed. But again, to come back to what we're really the reason I mentioned CellCon is because right now I don't think we are successfully um, managing that in a way that is most effective for the branches. Okay, thank you. Um... And then, uh, you know, just shifting back to education, I have a question. Uh, what is your number one priority? Um, and uh, from WOCS to improving PME across the board, what is your, you know, what, what's, your, what's your number one priority with regard to education? So, I, Steve, I would, you know, this is where he, we talk quite frequently, at, and I probably can, you know, guess what where he's going to go with this. But, Steve, if you're on the line, I don't want to, I take any of your uh, lane there if you, if you got it. Uh, that, that's okay, and I appreciate it, Rick. Because you know my number one priority is my boss's number one priority, um, and it's interesting because his number one priority right now is assessments, right? So for this fiscal year, if we do nothing else for warrant officer um, development, warrant officer leader expert development, it's going to be to develop and uh, implement those assessments that are going to allow us to assess the talent we have and also give us the feedback into the educational system we have to ensure that it is meeting army objectives um, and what we can do better right so so the assessments are the number one priority if, if i was going to go into the the next thing the thing that we're really you going to use the assessments to figure out and that is going to inform what we actually do with PME um, is going to be how are we, how close are we getting to the expected level of technical and tactical expertise that the Army is going to require for the Army of 2028? And that's the waypoint uh, uh, force, but, but that's, that, that's what we're targeting. We're looking at how do we develop the Army, uh, the Army warrant officer um, that can dominate their expertise in the Army of 2028. And so that's what we're gonna get out of the assessments. And that would be my very close number two priority. Over. When I say that. Hey, I, I've just got to, as, as you look at, um, 
at, at what uh, what Steve and Rick are, are talking about. So, so we're, as we look to the future, I think this is this is an area of expansion, and, and I think Army University and others are going to have to take a look at this. As you get more technical in in the signal field, just just as an example, you know, we send doctors out; they do continuing education, their board certification. There's all things to make sure that they're up to date with every current technology and way to do a specific surgery or. And that's how they use that model to be at the top of their game. In our current model, if we have these, these sporadic things in PME in the current construct, whether it's the advanced course, staff course, senior staff course, whatever we want to call it, and Steve's right, it needs to match, you know, kind of what we're doing. Uh, but I think the next evolution is for some of these technical specialties, they're going to have to go, whether it's training with industry and that's your little internship to do that, to have that capability. But I think this is a growth in industry, not just uh, in the signal field. But if you look at the fields that we have out there that we're going to need, that we really don't even have in the Army today, the eight uh, emerging tech leader fields that we're going through with AFC, you know, those are going to have continuing education things. We may have to send people out just like... Uh, one of the questions in here talks about advanced civil schooling, where we're going to have to send them out to get some kind of graduate degree. And then they're going to have to do those professional things, that continuation training in those in industry to maintain that, that really, really sharp edge. Because we expect our all of our soldiers to the, be the best and to be able to dominate on the battlefield. Um, and I, th I think that's a, that I think as 10 years from now, You'll look, they'll look back and go, I can't believe we weren't doing this. Well, it's brand new and, and we have the right people. I'm telling you with, with General Rainey at CAC and General Funk at TRADOC uh, and Steve and, and everybody here, at least in the talent management world, we're taking a hard look at that. We're looking at the future operating environment. You know, what is the army going to have to do? And, and if you've read the chief's people strategy, which is a year old now, uh, he's dead serious. People are number one. So if you're start if you're looking at people, you know, uh, in an old framework, you know, you're probably not meeting the mark. And I think this is just an area that that we're going to have to really explore, because one of the things we're seeing in our DASIS, and and I don't remember what DASIS, it's a survey you get in your birthday um, that we started a few months ago. But we're getting some really really interesting data on what are keeping soldiers and their families in an all volunteer army. And investing in those soldiers and their families, whether it's the ability to see the every MOS position across the globe, and they're like, oh, I didn't even know that was out there. I want to do that. To these kind of educational opportunities, investment in those soldiers and those families seems like probably one of the most powerful investment tool or uh, retention tools that we have. So thanks. Thank you, sir. Um, I am just shifting gears a little bit. I have a really great question on um, career management that uh, popped in. Uh, and the questioner asks, a lot of what was discussed today by the panel uh, is career management within the talent management framework. Uh, one area in career management that this individual thinks is lacking uh, is CW5 career management. Uh, and that, you know, we need to do a better job, a better job managing CW5s across all the branches in the Army. And uh, he said, I would propose a WOMO like COMO. I wonder if you might tackle that one. That's fine. <laughs> so, so I actually have a unique perspective on this, and I don't disagree with the question for sure. I'm not necessarily on board with that, but this is why we have these kind of discussions. What I will say, and this is coming from HRC prior to the being on the team here, is that uh, I was in a position there where I was responsible for the career management of the CW5s. And we did lack uh, continuity across the focus across HRC there. We used to have a CCWO there. Uh, and then a couple of commands ago that decided it wasn't required. And so we kind of were out there on our own in that, in that realm. Um, but it's, it has been uh, acknowledged, it has been recognized, and quite frankly, uh, when I got onto the team in January and, and started uh, my 
my life here at the first uh, planning conference, I kind of hesitated to jump into CW5s with a room full of CW5s because that's all we would talk about, right? And so I wanted to get after that low-hanging fruit, the thing that would affect some of those other folks out there first. And then obviously we can swing back, acknowledging that absolutely we do need to get after it. That's my short answer. Hey, hey so this is uh, Chief Yerby, if I may. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Hey, so, so Jack, I, you know, I, I'm a, with Rick, you know, I kind of agree that maybe we ought to have a office that manages CW5, but here's the challenge with that, is, is uh, warrant officers all have unique technical specialties, and if we think that we'll have a centralized office that can centrally manage the gr wide variety of the technical specialties in in a uh, effective way, I think we might be mistaken, or you know, we might you know just be fooling ourselves. So what we've done here, and I know other branches have done the same, is we've taken a look at our CW5 uh, assignments, and we kind of tiered them of hey, what's a what's a what of our um, positions, what positions are are good for, and uh, you know first. Uh, just got promoted to CW5. What what uh, le level positions are you know need to have some development as a CW5 before you move into? And then of course you know going on on up up that way. And then and then we've uh, you know gone to the point where um, we have what I would you know I'm using the term bod because everybody knows it, but it's truly not a bod. But we have an approval authority that uh, approves the kind of the slating of uh, the logistics CW5s. And I know AG has a, a similar, has a, a BOD that, that, that approves the slating of the CW5s. And so, so I think that's one way of getting after it without creating a centralized office. And I'm not sure if creating a centralized office would do us the justice because of our vast differences in technical specialties. Over. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, Chief Dixon Carter. Hey, John was, he's on it, Mr. Yerby, um, pretty much echoing what he was saying is that um, having a centralized location that manages all the W-5s is a great initiative. But at the end of the day, if I get my senior leadership to sign off of me not moving, then it's still, man we're still not managing the way that we, we should be managing things. And so it management starts as an individual, self-development, um, it also, we have to be transparent. There are a couple of nominative positions there, not a couple, there are more than a couple of nominative positions that's out there across the total cohort that's out there. And when those positions open up, we have to open it up. We have to open it up, give, give everybody an opportunity and screen the packets. And if I don't match it based on the prere prerequisites, if my KSBs do not match the requirements, then I, you know, then you remove my name from the list. But you also owe me to tell me why my name was removed from the list so that I can prepare if I want to compete again or for another assignment, if you will. So we have to be transparent in the process as well as we're managing our assignments, our nominative assignments and, and special positions, if you will, for that. And I, I think Mr. Mr. Robinson. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so this is a very uh, interesting topic uh, of discussion, and, and and I'm echoing what everyone else says. So, so for us, um, you know, I don't know if our numbers are large or small, but we're 32 <coughs> W5s, and we have 32 positions. But out of those 32 positions, 16 of them are somewhat nominative. They work for a general officer, right? So the general officer gets a vote in who's going to sit at the table yep. for him. With, with them in, in their in on their squad. Right. And, and with that being said, the way that that is happening is um, our W5s are all slated once a year for all of the signal cyber guys um, and, and Lieutenant General Morrison, the G6, has the final approval of, yes, this guy, uh, we, you know, the slate, you know, here's the five guys that will interview to go to Forcecom G6 to work for General X. General X interviews, down selects, interviews three of the guys. He selects guy number one. He emails General Morrison, says, hey, I'd like I'd like Robinson. General Morrison says, yes, right. Robinson scratches him off the list. So 
And so they go down the line and selecting the guys every every year for all of the nominated positions. What is interesting now, now that we have the AIM marketplace, now we have to go back and be ahead of that and make sure that you're one for one matching in the marketplace for the guy who's interviewed for the job versus uh, some guy saying, hey, you know, I want to I want to go to that job. And, you know, it, it, it's a it's an interesting wrinkle that we're trying to work around and hopefully we'll find some market rules to help govern uh, CW5 talent management um, a little bit better in the future. Jack, one comment just to jump on what uh, Will just brought up there at the end with ATAP. It's one of the things I think is brilliant about it is we've kind of run this before to see, and, and again, coming from HRC after the first cycle, I actually delayed arriving here so I could see a full cycle from HRC. One thing that we saw was People have a pretty good idea, just as he said, especially those high pinnacle nominative positions of who they want until they see everybody. Right. And they don't necessarily go right. with the person they That's were going right. to go after. So mm -hmm. I think there is some value in that transparency on both sides. Yes. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Great answers. Great answers. Um, so, and this may be a Mr. Robinson question. What is being done? Thought it may be a Mr. Yerby question too. What is being done to ensure warrant officers in high demand, <coughs> low density technical specialties are being talent aligned into the right position at the right time in their career? And I think you alluded to it earlier, but I think it's worth drilling down a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So KS, KSBs are going to be and KSAs are going to be important. Um, also, um, the COE, cyber COE and the signal and uh, single branch and cyber branch are really going to have to start looking at if at brigade at a infantry brigade a, a, or an aviation brigade, the W-2 must have these key attributes to have this job. If he's going to if you have a W-3 at the division CP and he is the uh, cyberspace coordinator, here are the 12 things that. He has to have here are the three credentials that he has to have to be able to do those skills. We're going to have to get to that kind of granularity level that will enable the person who's doing the hiring to say, yep. you know, <laughs> I've interviewed Chief Robinson. He has seven of the 12 uh, uh, technical expertise that he needs. However, he's working on two of them and three of them. I know I can develop them. And, and I really like his prior assignments that he's had. So I really want this guy over the guy that has all 12 of them because that guy doesn't have the other expertise that I have. So we got to get to that level of granularity. What's also going to be interesting as the army builds out its software factory and have uniform software developers and all those things, how do we start to cultivate that environment to have in signal warrant officers be coders? And, and that gives us a whole new wrinkle that goes back to the future to when 251 alphas were um, <laughs> um, doing punch cards and that type of thing. So, uh, but it's going to be, an, it's going to be an interesting change as we try to develop um, granularities to be able to help the army talent management task force. And not only, I want to just point out this one last point, not only for us to hire the right talent, but to harvest the right talent, right. to have the database, to be able to say who's do, who has what skill and we can pluck that individual and place them in where we need them to be. Yes, Great answer. And while I got you on the hot seat, I got one more for you, but I think others are going to want to chime in on it. Uh, what's your opinion of direct appointment of a person that has, say, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or higher in cyber or signal? Um, uh, so a direct appointment into, say, the signal branch or cyber branch or pretty much any other branch like doctors, lawyers, whatever. Um, you know, I'd just be interested in your thoughts, but I figure I, you know, I had you on the hot seat already. And so, so cyber has that going now, uh, okay. our 17 guys have that going now. I think that the 25s need to start looking at that as well, because there, there are people that are, um, that want to serve the nation. Right. Um, and they, they, uh, may have, um, you know, there was one guy who went to the cyber branch. He, he, he was actually, he had actually owned his own company. Um, so, but he wanted to, he wanted to serve and do offensive cyberspace operation. He would never have any other place to do it, but in the United States army. So I think that when we start seeing guys that have advanced degrees in data science or even machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, we may want, we may want to 
direct appoint those guys. I, I am in support of it. I, I, I don't speak for, you know, General Morrison or, or General Hersey, the, the COE commander, but I, I think that would be something that we, we should look at. Anybody want to? I could add just one comment that I think is important too with granularity like this is it many of these things are one they're pilots we start small and then we scale appropriately and they don't have to be automatically across every branch they can be where they're most applicable and the branches and proponents that feel that this is going to be something that will help them and that's that's not limited to rank that's that goes across the board on as, as you probably have heard there's commission officer direct commissions out there as well for the same motivation behind it. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Hey, Jack, if I, if I can throw a little plug for KSBs in that, right? So as we're looking at the KSBs that we expect for WSBs to possess, that gives us a tool to look at these potential candidates or these applicants that might be in the civilian workforce. They might be doing a skill that's very uh, correlatable to what we expect the to do in the Army. And we can assess those KSBs or, or assess that person against that common set of KSBs and maybe not just direct appoint them after the completion of basic training and Warrant Officer Candidate School and the, and the WOBC, but maybe this is the tool we use to determine at what level we might um, direct commission, such as direct to CW2. Um, we're, I know we're experimenting with that in a couple fields, but as we start to get the KSBs, that's going to help us inform the reason we would do that. And, and, and that might open that aperture up that uh, Mr. Robinson was talking about. Oh. Okay, but are we like envisioning this as a street to seat kind of situation or, or? It really depends, honestly. It depends. Okay. Well, needs of the Army, right? <laughs> Let's face it. Um, so, so this is Chief Fury. I'd like to go back, if I may, to the uh, question about, you know, how do we uh, employ talent? Sure. Yes, sir. If, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. So, that, so I think Mr. Robinson answered the question very, very well from one, per, one, one side of it and, and how we employ talent. But I, I do have some recommendations on how we can better uh, employ uh, talent through the Army distribution process. Maybe we need to look at a few things um, because as I highlighted in my uh, introduction um, is, uh, you know, some of our policies don't quite, uh, you know, en en enable the talent management and alignment process as, as best as it could. Maybe for warrant officers, we need to, uh, you know, combine our two distribution cycles into one. And that will give us a much bigger pool and maybe help us align talent. Maybe we need to have supplemental manning guidance to ensure low density populations go to the right place to achieve Army readiness. You know, that gives us that pinpoint precision management uh, by MOS, if you will. Uh, or maybe we should uh, stop aggregating warrant officers to meet the Ar uh, active component manning guidance. Uh, for example, a maintenance warrant officer can't do what a property book officer does and vice versa, nor can a 90 alpha, that's a, uh, you know, a, um, a O grade uh, logistician. Um, maybe we need to relook at how direct fills impact low density technical specialties uh, across the Army, which, you know, that's applied, direct fills are applied right off the top, right, taken right off the top uh, of available um, you know, warrant officers. Uh, or maybe we have a, a separate MER so units can prioritize their, their requirements better as opposed to aggregating, you know, the MER in, into both warrant officers and, and O-grade officers. Uh, and then again, um, I think uh, that the branch proponents must apply, must ha be, be in the process to apply the KSBs to positions in, in AIM not just the units. I think it, it takes both to, to, to um, apply input to the KSBs for those positions. Of course, the units know what they need, um, but the, the branch kind of has to set that standard of, hey, what you're asking for is, is you know, above that MOS, 
MOS or a grade, if you will. And so those are a few things that uh, I'd just like to throw out to kind of get to how we better um, manage and align talent, uh, in particular for our warrant officers. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm getting a lot of questions on the future of, of PME, obviously, um, from from the field. Um, it's just sort of in general, what are we doing to stay technically proficient based on formal on the formal technical training we receive in a warrant officer 30 year career model? And, uh, you know, what are we doing to to manage that as a priority, which it, it's listening to you all that is a priority and we're putting more emphasis back on that priority, but also getting after maybe the more common core stuff that we need as we progress throughout a career. To be uh, to have utility. I don't know who wants to yeah, jump on that. I think Steve. Steve. Yep. This is his. Steve. Oh you boy. Go. Okay. Uh, I guess <laughs> throw the card at me. Okay. Great. So, hey, uh, those are great points, and right, and, and we owe the right analysis, and that's the part of the the process we're in right now. We have a window of opportunity, right? If we want to become more of what the army, or or better at what the army wants from us, right? We've got to do the analysis and figure out what that more or that better is. And once we figure that out, we have to go back to the Army with a coherent plan that will achieve that objective that the Army wants for us. At that point, I'm confident, given some of the other meetings I've been in and some of the other things the Army is investing in, some of the other educational programs the Army is investing in, because they're good ideas, we're talking about the Army's technical and tactical experts. And when we go to the Army with a plan of, hey, sir, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is how we're going to get to what you want more of or you want us to do better or you want us to be ahead of because technology is advancing so quickly. Here's how we get there. I'm confident that we will get the investment that is required to get our warrant officers there. Now, there's two kinds of investment, right? There's the common investment. And I'm not talking about common core. I'm talking about the investment that goes into the, the warrant officer who stays on course and goes to all the right assignments through the course of their career from a session to eventual separation, retirement, a soldier for life. And then there's the other ones that we want to invest in for very specific and special things. So those would be things like training with industry, right? Not everyone's going to get a training with industry opportunity, even if we desire that, right? Because we can't formulate a requirement. But what we have to do is we have to look at what do we require every, and I'll throw this one, uh, to, you know, to, to the signal guys out there, you know, what do we expect every 255 November CW3 to be able to do, right? That's where we're going to get the, from the KSBs, every single one of them. So now we have to figure out the plan to train and educate them to that level at a minimum, right? And that might mean certifications. That might mean civilian education opportunities. But we have to lay that down, not for the purpose of getting um, civilian education opportunities or internships, but that these are the only means of achieving what the Army expects from us, right? And then when we go to the Army with a plan, then the Army decides whether to accept low risk, which is spend all the money it takes to get there, moderate risk, which is coming up with a hybrid plan and spending a little bit of the money, or spending no money. And then the Army gets what it gets um, based on its investment. I'm pretty sure we'll be in the moderate risk to the low risk if we come with a good, reasonable, achievable, coherent plan to achieve the level of technical dominance that the Army deserves from its warrant officers. Now, as we do the analysis, some of our branches, some of our MOSs might be in better position, better shape than others. We may find that out. Um, and then we'll learn lessons from them that we can apply to the other uh, um, proponents. And so that's what we're going to get out of this holistic approach to the warrant officer education problem is really, or the warrant officer education analysis, which is really an individualized solution for the individual warrant officer rooted in assessments, and then semi-individualized by, by applying best practices across the, the um, entire cohort specific to the branches and MOSs that will assistance over. Thank you, Mr. Kilgore. Um, so I have another question. Uh, is considering bonuses for certifications like senior professional in HR certificate, project management professional IT certifications, 
being considered to retain high, highly qualified warrant officers. So I'll take that one. It's a short answer. So um, again, having been at HRC to see some of that, that's really driven by the proponent or the branch based on the needs that they recognize. And then they, they work that up through uh, into G1 for, uh, yeah, for processing basically. So the short answer is yes, that they are being considered to say they turn towards their proponent for that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm also wondering if you can uh, discuss uh, warrant officer professional development models and the impact that Army Talent, the Army Talent Alignment Program and the Army Talent Management uh, Task Force initiatives might change those, uh, those uh, professional development models. <laughs> it's very general. So I guess I'll take a first stab at it. So, so I think I think a lot of us actually would have a slice of this on, on the on the answer. Whether you're talking about the model which shows the timing of PME, the the model which shows currently time and grade for um, for promotion, which is one of the things that uh, we are actually looking at is. Is time and grade an automatic reason why you should be up for promotion? I mean, why are we tied to an industrial age? So I think there's a lot of a, a lot of pieces uh, to that puzzle, and I do feel like as we get away from an industrial age type of approach, that I think you'll see those models start to change. And I also, this is kind of why we've talked about expanding the um, categories, maybe from just the two to the centers of excellence, because what we'd like to see is the centers of excellence focus on the responsibilities that they have at that level, because they're going to really know better than a, a, an army wide uh, model for how the warrant officer should flow through. And that's why you see they are generally broken down by branches, at least inside uh, the, the regs. I think in keeping with, um, you know, Chief uh, General McConville has said it pretty much since April. He's been saying the time is now. The AUSA theme, um, the time is now. So in much of what we are doing, many of the questions that's being asked out there, um, it is in consideration. There are a lot of discussions about different things that need to change. Um, you may have heard Chief say, say that every 40 years, we really should be looking at how we do business. You know, um, and, and maybe 40, the number 40 may not necessarily be the magic number, but it is a number. And the time is now for us to look as an army, to look across, you know, our army and see what things can be changed. It's not that anything is being done wrong, but I mean, as as time passes, as our nation change, so does our army, so does our Air Force, so does the Marine Corps, so does the Navy, so does the Coast Guard, you know, um, so does our communities. And so change is good. And the time to change is now. So our professional development model will change over a course of time. And it's going to take our center of excellence and our proponents to help us to shape what's the right professional development model for your skills, for your branch at the, at the appropriate level, W1, 2, 3, or 4. So um, I would encourage each and every one of us to embrace change because it is coming and the time is truly now. So for uh, for us, uh, for signal guys and the cyber guys per se, um, so so one of the things that we're looking at is is uh, how do we? It's a continuous learning cycle. So we you know we go to whatever the basic course equivalent would be. Um, we can't wait five years or four years to skill ourselves at Fort Gordon or Fort Pick a Place. So, so how do we deliver content over time? And, and oh, by the way, we, we could spend two years at Fort Gordon training and still not be trained on every skill that we need, right? So how, how do we give enough and then 
iteratively a constant learning cycle from a distant learning process and then a and then a structured portion <coughs> and, it, and it's iterative throughout a cycle throughout the throughout our career to make sure that we're continuously reskilling ourselves and then the <laughs> Chinese as a finishing component to make sure that we're going from you know basic to intermediate to advanced to senior to mastery of craft. It's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out and 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 how how we leverage the people strategy in order to to uh, to develop the talent over the years. Well, and I and, and I hope by the way that that helps answer some of the other questions we've had from people. Hey, you know, I'm already at this level of you know the command structure. You know, where's my talent management to go to the next level? And it, it might be perhaps that they're already at a level that, you know, maybe they shouldn't be at that level yet. Maybe we've sort of cheated them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I wonder if, you know, if that's, if that's really a big concern for talent management, um, that, Hey, you know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta stop, take a breath, figure out how to track someone successfully for a career. And what I'm also hearing from you all and, and, um, chief Nolton, maybe you can, maybe you can amplify this is, don't just, I, you know, what I'm really getting at is the whole two-time non-selecting year out thing. You know, um, maybe we need to, you know, maybe that's really sort of at the crux of what we're doing. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Jack, I think that's just one great example of where we have, a, you know, a decision that was, there was reason for that to be made 30, you know, plus years ago in the Warrant Officer Management Act, but we're seeing now, that 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 cut in uh, talent that we're seeing at that level, and then ironically, to not be able to allow them to retire and go into the guard or reserve, even it's just it's just uh, you know it's just one of those things that why did we not fix this sooner? So that's the that's what I appreciate about the team that's not just on the floor here, but the leadership as well as they absolutely acknowledge there's a, there's plenty of things out there we can identify and get after, and we have the support to do it right now. It's just that they they, they take energy. You got to. You got to juggle, you know, and make sure you don't pick up too much at once so that you're not losing everything. Yeah. Um, but I, I see clearly there's there's a need for it. And I think clearly there's uh, energy in, in those directions to get after how we're going to solve it. Um, and, and sort of as a just sort of a general question, uh, perhaps again for you, uh, Rick, um, how much of a challenge are I think, you know, I see most of the, the changes being contemplated in the work that you guys are doing um, in, in Army talent management as being things that we can implement within the service. But what challenges are you having in particular with warrant officers with the fact that, um, for example, when we, when we fought for the pay compression pay raises and the CW5 pay grade, well, we had to go to every single service mm -hmm. and get buy-in on what we wanted to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the challenges like that that you're facing with your with your efforts in, in Army talent management? So that I'll, I'll come back on one angle on that is the Title X uh, a study that we're doing to see if we could really, do we have to have every change that we want that's at the legislative level done and bought into by all the services and the short answer is no there's no reason why we should be tying and by, for them to free that up and allow them to manage the way that they would like to and we want to do that sooner than later simply because of the type of approach that we have to our unique branch to our unique warrant officers i should say and the leadership that is recognizing that we have that voice they want to help us get after it and that's that's just one example of how we could have a sweeping change uh, to address that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question, uh, uh, I, I, obviously from a reserve component person. Um, is the talent assessment going to be offered to the reserve and National Guard? AIM-2 is only offered to the active duty. Will there be something that focuses on reserve or National Guard to pull warrant officers into active duty if they're qualified. Sure. So, so the answer for for right now, we really don't have the ability to do that structurally. I mean, some of them are legislative. 
uh, but but the uh, to underpin the whole thing, you know, the National Guard Compo Two is used in Ips A, and we're fielding that in the Army. Well, once that system gets fielded throughout the total Army, at least we can see our Army from that perspective because AIM works in those compos. Uh, I think the power of it is, if you, if you look, especially at the Warrant Officer Corps, be, because of the expertise they have, we really don't need that walking out the door. And at certain times in a family's uh, life, they really need to be stable. And wouldn't it be nice if you were a Compo 1 Warrant Officer, doesn't matter what MOS, and there was a position that you could stabilize in compo two or three in this location that benefits your family so you can continue to serve. And then once you meet that whatever family goal period, high school, I mean, whatever it is. Um, and then AIM two opens up, it's very permeable. You can see all compos like, you know something, I want that job. Oh, that's in compo one, doesn't matter. Uh, Secretary Esper back in January of 18 made the statement that permeability is one of the things that limits our ability to, to manage our talent permeability among compos. So I, I think that that's a longer term goal because obviously that's a slog um, because there, there's so many second and third order effects that have to be considered. Uh, but I do think eventually we will figure this out and get the right legislation to kind of moderate uh, you know, how you do it. But, but I think that's where we need to go. In an all volunteer army, you can't just shed talent just because you didn't have the right rule or didn't have the ability to have somebody that retired from the active duty that has all the KSBs required in this AIM-2 thing, once we get that in the, in the reserve components, you should be able to apply. And if you get hired, go do that thing. You know, we, we, we should not be limiting our ability to use talent. So I know it was kind of a longer answer, but but I do think uh, that's where we need to go because we got the same question from PCC the other night uh, from one of our COMPO3 hospital commanders. Uh, and it, it just, it makes so much sense. We just got to figure that one out. So that'll, that'll, be, that'll be kind of one of those pushes uh, that we're going to make to find out what stops us from doing it. Thank you, sir. Right. Um, hey, so hey, can I... I uh, oh. Add to that, this is Chief Yerby. Yes, yes, sir. Hey, so, uh, so you know, General Drew is, is is spot on. I think permeability. We got to figure that out. That's gonna that is gonna help our force. I honestly think it could potentially be a game changer for our entire force. Uh, that permeability. But I thought I heard in the question um, part of about assessments. And so um, I know Steve uh, talked about assessments, and I would just say that, um, you know, when we do assessments, uh, uh, particularly here at the P at PME, at the schoolhouse, is those assessments will be for all compos. It won't be for uh, just compo one. And the goal of that assessment is, is to just show the officer where they're at at that particular time in their competence continuum and to provide them an individual development plan that they can take and do self-development or go back to the unit and figure out uh, what they need to do to, uh, to work on their weaknesses and maybe even uh, coach, teach, and mentor on some of their strengths. And so I just wanted to cover that assessment piece of that question. Over. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I'm going to I'm going to read this question, but uh, and then I'm going to ask you for the nugget, <laughs> the nugget on it. Um, we have a question with a large number of warrant officer specialties being one deep in organizations. Um, and the fact that warrant officers develop through progressive levels of assignments as has the talent management task force looked at creating a unique set of business rules for warrant officer assignment management to allow for more of a precision management approach versus the current model that appears effective for uh, O-grade population management, but not as well for low density warrant officer specialties. Could this possibly be another avenue to improve our talent base by better developing talent over the course of a career? And I think the real nugget in there is, um, you know, how are we getting after that problem with those low density MOSs? I'm, I'm thinking, that's a huge challenge as we develop folks. And so, Jack, so I, that is a that is a good question. That really could be a discussion in itself. Yeah. Um, 
But to, to get to the heart of, I think, where, what the in, uh, intent of this is, and this is actually, it comes back to my comment about staying at HRC for a full cycle of AIM before coming up here to just see from start to stop the things that we could probably get after and improve in the warrant officer. So there were plenty, and we saw that. And we did, as I came up here, I didn't mention that as an initiative that I'm a lead of, but it's an initiative team that I'm a part of. And so as we had those discussions on how to improve um, our ATAP, well, that's one of the things that we brought up was, you know, we didn't see, the, we didn't like how the flat market was have, uh, allowing folks to, to pick jobs that they probably aren't even qualified for. And, 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 uh, and, and I, I jumped to that just for a second, just to say, this is where there's work on both sides. There's an investment uh, on the side of professionalism of the individual, and there's an investment on the, on the side of the, of the team. But what, what wasn't the aim wasn't even capable of at the time was to recognize those skills, those those SQIs. And so as we enhance each cycle, you'll see improvements. We actually have a, a fellow warrant officer that was able to pull up to HRC in this last cycle that one of his skills is computer programming. And so he is deep, neck deep into the warrant officer piece of that so that we do have toggle capability for SQIs, so we can see the jobs that we're qualified for, so that we can look at them by grade. And so as I said to him in a discussion about this was, you know, if we could develop this like Zillow, I wanna be able to see everything, because I wanna know what I can, I wanna, uh, you know, the, look forward to as, I, as my uh, career progresses, and maybe what places that I can discuss with my family that, they're, that are out there that I never even thought of. But we also have to be professionals and we have to recognize that. And I can tell you, that's one of the things that we really have to be careful about at HRC there is that there are so many one of jobs that if that job is not brought into and, and considered validated in the cycle, it's not even in the market. And so there's, that takes work. That takes, that takes an effort on the career managers that are there uh, representing the individuals, but it's also the account managers that are recognizing the shortages that they see, exactly what Mr. Yerby was talking about uh, earlier. So when you get that granular, it takes extra time. It was probably three more, three times the effort the very first time we did this, just to try to get it right in that last cycle. And for me, that was last fall, it was a year ago, actually. But, but as we start to uh, improve the software, the software can start recognizing some of these things that we're looking for too. And that allows units to drill into exactly the type of skills that they're looking for to fill that one up job, instead of having to click through 60 or 70 feet people, just trying to find the guy that actually is the instructor pilot that can fly this or this, or the, um, you know, the a signal person that can do that or the MP that has, you know, this qualification. So I th we're, we're getting there. And then the last thing I'll say on that, on that comment, because we talked about all three composts, with the combination of this coming into IPSA, this is just a bridging strategy. This is an HRC talent management bridging strategy into IPSA. So once we get into IPSA, that capability is going to increase. It'll look similar, but it's going to be better. And it's going to be better because we are going to be able to recognize KSB specifically skills and look at those one of jobs out there and have individuals see them as well. So that's it. Thanks. Well, thank you, Chief. And you've taken us right up until the last minute with this with this panel. Um, I, sir, do you have any 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 final thoughts, sir? No, just just thank you again. This this is important for our army. I mean, that's why people and if people didn't. Uh, if our soldiers and, and, uh, and our communities didn't really get it, you know, people is number one to General McConville and, and he's not gonna back off. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with the Warrant Officer Association uh, and talk about these issues in detail. I took some notes, I got some research to do and between Rick and I, we're gonna start getting after it. Ms. Dixon Carter. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, again, messaging what um, General Drew has said. Um, our senior leaders, Army senior leaders, secretary, chief of staff, and the sergeant major of the Army are all messaging people first. This is my squad. If this is your squad, make sure you take care of your squad and treat each other with dignity and respect. And we will make sure that we get after talent management and we get after those other other things that are affecting and affecting our, our army and that sharp incidents, that suicides, racism and extremism. We can do it together and we can do it together better.
Well, on that note, I'll just point out at the risk of saying it for the 12th time today, as far as our warrant officer squad, we got, we got the best one that we've had in a hundred years. And thank you again to each and every one of our brilliant panelists uh, for making us all smarter. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.